Hello and welcome to this video in which we create a miniature atomic garden. Now, this is a modern take on Gretika Mendel's experiments on heritability using peas. To understand why we're doing this, let's start with the basic background. Gregor Mendel was a 19th century friar who bred peas with traits. These peas were crossbred and the subsequent peas were able to inherit some of these traits but not others from the parent plants. This led to the foundation of modern genetics, generally referred to as Mendelian genetics. Mendel's method was simple in theory but tedious in practice. It's why it took his work years to complete. He spent about six to seven years from start to finish. Mendel planted his peas out in a large field. He then recorded the pea flower colour, shape, form and so on. At the end of the season he collected the seeds to plant out again next time. This was roughly done once a year. By manually pollinating some peas and segregating them, he could see if some traits were heritable or not. This also led to whether or not crossbreeding some plants led to a trait being retained or lost. We now describe these as recessive or dominant traits. This brings us to the most recent major jump in plant breeding that can be done by anyone. Atomic gardening. This followed the Manhattan Project and the use of the atomic bomb. A more peaceful use was sought for it. Uh, mostly, uh, can we uh, stop trying to kill people with radiation in watches, and instead, uh, can we try and use it to make life better, somehow, again, preferably without radiating people. This, in short, was when plants were exposed to a radiation source, atomic gardening. Uh, this causes mutations. Uh, rarely these are good. Most are very bad, and a few do nothing. It is how we came to have uh, certain plants. In fact, there are about uh, 2,000 commonly available plants, a peppermint being one, and another is the Rio Red Grapefruit. Both of these are fairly well known, but arguably they're not as common as either conventional hybridization, which leads to things like a, uh, let's say, what's the right word for it? Well, to be blunt about it, not a particularly useful plant, as you can only plant it once, and then you have to worry about getting hybrids again. On the other hand, you have genetically modified crops which are increasingly common although by no means accessible to the average person inside their home, and definitely not something you can do yourself for the most part. The basic premise of the atomic garden is that it is, well, a garden, or in some cases a field, laid out in a circle. Inside the circle centre is a tall pole. This tall pole has a radiation source on it that can be retracted into the pole to seal away the radiation, and this allows people to go out there and check what's happening without getting irradiated. With the field being a circle, the crops planted around it get a reasonably similar dose of radiation in each ring around it. This means you have uh, successive doses with distance. Arguably, this is going to be helpful, particularly for what we're going to do shortly, but with distance increasing, less radiation exposure means less theory, or at least in theory, fewer mutations. But this may not hold true in all cases, it very much depends on the dose. But with how we've designed ours, it means a dose response should be created, very similar to what an atomic garden was meant to do. Uh, this brings us to creating a similar experiment. Understand, there is, as with most experiments, some risk, but if you take appropriate care and precaution, the risk is minimal. It includes what we're doing here. To start with, we have our radiation source. We are using americinium, americinium, how is it pronounced? Americium or Americium. Ah, yes. Americium. The temptation to call this either radioactive freedom, the freedom atom, or something similar is strong, but we'll try and stick with what it's actually called. Americium 241 is a very common radioactive element that can and should be found in the vast majority of households. It is the radioactive element used in ionizing smoke detectors. Yeah, every household, as odd as it may sound, should have a source of radiation present. In fact, ideally several, but let's assume for now you have just the one, at a minimum. The reason we've chosen this particular element, let's say, is twofold. The first is that unlike uranium or other exciting and far more powerful radiation sources, this is not just easily accessible, but it won't get you put on a terror watch list or have the Fed show up wanting to know about your backyard nuclear reactor. The second reason is far more directly related to safety. Americ cesium-241 has a very low power level. That is, the ionizing effect of the alpha emissions of this 
have a very short range and are very weak. It means you shouldn't be exposed to the radiation when it is housed in a plastic smoke detector casing, and you can create a similar phenomena when you set up your own if you so wish to try and follow along. But we have uh, recreated the protective effect of the smoke detector housing by doing two things. First, we've put the radioactive experiment piece into a glass case. The glass case is enough to stop the radiation from getting out by itself. That is how weak the emission is. The second is that the radiation cannot travel very far, so it should be able to be effective on the peas themselves, but not get any further. We say this as your a typical modern smoke detector, at least in terms of ionizing versions, it contains about one microcurie of the americium, which is a really, really small amount. Understand, it's more than enough to be able to decay fast enough to detect smoke, but it's nowhere near enough to actually cause any harm, at least not inside of its housing. What you basically have in there is the equivalent of roughly one third of a microgram of americium oxide, which isn't pure americium by itself, so that's again another issue. And this is a significant decrease, at least over older models. Understand, older models had significantly more, and it had roughly three times as much, so you had nearly one microgram of a museum of radioactive freedom. The ionizing substance itself, the isotope americium used in smoke detectors, is americium-241, and this decays by the production of alpha get rays. These are marked by this particular symbol. It's a symbol for alpha. And when this happens, it breaks down from americium-241 into neptunium-237. If you wanted a half of what is in the smoke detector to disappear, you would need to wait about 430 or so years. Yeah, your radioactive sample inside here will well and truly outlast the plastic housing that it's held within, which is kind of funny in a way. The other thing of note here is that your typical ionizing smoke detector, whether it's relatively modern or a much older version, will be made up of a combination of americium and neptunium. And that's for a very simple reason. One gets turned into the other. Now, there are a variety of other elements included, for example, the oxide that makes up the americium oxide, but other than that, you have a bunch of other things. Within, let's say, 30 years, about 5% of your americium will have turned into neptunium. So, arguably, after 5 years, you could calculate just how much theoretical gamma rays and alpha rays and so on have been emitted. It's going to emit somewhere around 37,000 alpha particles each second. Now, if you've taken it out of its casing as we have, these will obviously make their way out. If it's kept within its casing, almost none of these, if any at all, will. One thing you can do if you have any concerns whatsoever is literally put a piece of paper in the way. That is enough to stop these alpha particles getting through as they only have an energy of about 5.4 millivolts, so it's tiny, and it can't even really penetrate a few centimeters of air, let alone the human epidermis, so your skin provides more than enough protection, unless you go around licking the insides of smoke detectors or snorting them, in which case you should probably find an adult and ask them to take you home, because you shouldn't be playing inside a smoke detector, and that's really the only way you're going to be endangered. Inhaling it or ingesting it. It is worth being somewhat cautious as a result though in dismantling a smoke detector if you are so wishing to access the insides. We should point out that a americium 241 will emit gamma rays. Now these are a bigger concern. Understand gamma rays, although they can theoretically give you superpowers, aren't going to really do so. You aren't going to turn into the Hulk or Spider-Man just because you've been exposed to it. You'll probably get cancer, but you're not going to get very much. And this is important here, remembering that because of what we've taken out, we have a directed beam of this being emitted out, which means you can avoid just about all of the danger. And the danger really does only consist of somewhere between 9 and 50 nanosivets. A 1 civet is roughly equivalent to 100 millirem, and you can be exposed to about 300 millirems, or effectively 3 civets, just from background radiation sources in everyday life. So, yeah you don't really have to worry about it. You have uh, somewhere around the range of uh, 8 millirems from x-rays, uh, 
of your chest anyway. A, a, a CT scan of your head would be about 1,100 millirems, and getting irradiated for thyroid problems is going to be somewhere around 7,000 millirems. So you're really not going to get exposed to all that much. Again, assuming that you're not pointing it out yourself constantly. The other point to note out is that the amount that you'd be exposed to, let's say for comparison to something more practical, is a banana. You would get somewhere around one-tenth to one-half of the dose of radiation from this particular source as you would from eating a banana. Yeah. So you're not going to be anywhere near any kind of harm from this. It's practically negligible. So yes, it is entirely safe. Understand, you're not exposed to it in the same way the design is made. What we have is a, a very simple glass house. It's about 50 centimeters by 25 centimeters or 20 by 10 inches. It is a simple, effectively plastic walled metal framed unit. In this, we've placed six rows of three pots. In each pot, we have basic seed raising mix. Each pot has exactly one pea placed into the soil and one bamboo skewer to act as a trellis. The maracesium radiation source is placed on the wall at one end of the glass house. Each pea involved is meant to take between 8 and 12 weeks to produce new peas. And that's the supposed time before you can get something out of it. The same pea should be able to be grown indefinitely, as we've chosen what is described as a heirloom variety. But what differentiates an heirloom variety from others is that they are supposed to be stable as a germline. That is, they are not a hybrid, which will show throwback traits, and not produce seeds true to form if you grow them again. Heirlooms are also supposed to show, or at least grow, a seed or pea in this case that is a direct copy of the parent for all intents and purposes. That means we should be able to grow these peas forever and get the same result every time for the most part. That is unless we start doing something weird and wonderful, like exposing it to radiation. We also have a group of control peas planted separately to the side, where they'll not be exposed to the radiation source. We have control peas as they should be copies of the original, that is they're the same packet of seeds, but without any, uh, let's say, variables to play on them. It should allow us to draw a comparison to any anomalous changes due to the environment, generations, and so on. So for example, if some of the control peas start showing certain odd behavior, we know that we can mostly ignore that from the experimental group. If we only see it in the experimental group, it's a fairly straightforward thing to be able to say, a likely cause. The plan is, at least somewhat, to recreate Mendel's experiment. We are going to take peas from each plant and we're going to replant it at the end of the season. That is, each pot, which should be one of three, we're hoping to get a triplicate of each result, will be continuously grown season on season. This should, understand there's a lot of variables that are going to come to play, give us a plant that has the mutations from the radiation source. And while planting more would be better, we're not trying to create a diversity of mutations, but rather we want to see how many or how much of a mutation occurs, not just by dose, that is how far away from the radiation source, but importantly, whether or not there are any mutations. And that means that we have an original source, that is the plant that's been irradiated, and we have the control group, which is the same group of peas that will be continuously grown onwards without any radiation, but each pot will be replaced with a new pea plant that's been taken from its parent. And so we should have our first generation now, which is based on the original out-of-the-packet seeds. These arguably should be fairly true to form, but it will be compared to the control just in case, and each successive generation will be treated the same way. This should allow us to see, throughout successive generations, the effect of the radiation exposure, and importantly, the effect of radiation exposure based on distance. In theory, again, remembering this is very much the setup stage, there should be a dose response. That is, the peas growing closest to the maricinium should have the most mutations, if they grow at all. As the peas get further away, the mutation rate should decrease. And by planting our peas from each plant again and again, we should see any mutations compound over time. This will lead to a somewhat unique effect, but we're hoping to at least get somewhat of a consistent effect based on distance. And most likely this will just be things like flowers, colour, size, shape, and so on, which is where we're replicating Mendel's experiments. 
we're also planning to plant out a second set of peas from this. That is, you have your control group, and you have your experimental group that's been constantly irradiated the entire time. But each time we get a generation of peas from that radiated source, we're going to take them and put them to a site and grow them again. What we want to see is whether or not the peas that have initially been irradiated and then grown on will develop not only mutations, particularly given that first generation and subsequent generations, but how stable the mutations are, if any. Unlike Mendel's experiments, where, well, to be blunt about it, he relied on crossbreeding or hybridizing in effect from different pea species or subsets of pea species, but we're instead using radiation to create changes. We are still seeing if the heritability of genes exists. The difference is if the changes are not just present, but how adverse or beneficial they are. For example, we might see that some of the initially stable P lines, after being left to grow outside of the radiation source, actually stop working after a time, as there are problems with how many mutations that aren't obvious just based on flower and similar that have built up inside of it. In other cases, we may not see some of our peas grow at all, ever, as they've basically been sterilized. There will be a range of possible effects. It is important for us to reiterate that we have set this up and chosen a particular radiation source with safety in mind. We are relying on both physical barriers and distance for safety. This should be more than enough to ensure safety for what we're doing. You can of course do other things to ensure things work out, for example using foil or lead barriers if you so wish, for example roof flashing. The other thing to note is that this will be a very long term project. We cannot simply grow the peas in one day or a week. The time to get new peas is at least 8 weeks, and so we'll be lucky to get 3-5 to five generations a year, if we are not left with just one or perhaps two generations a year. And that's because we need to try and find a way to grow them in times of year and seasons where they're just not amenable to doing so. It's not that we can't, but it will be much more challenging. We'll update you over time as we see what happens, and particularly if we begin getting results that are worth noting. Thank you for watching this video. If you found it interesting, consider liking, sharing, and subscribing. Please do post any comments, questions, or suggestions you have below.